Hey everybody, welcome to reading class week five. Um, I'm here with some updates for you. A lot of people have reached out this week about work being made mandatory uh, from the Springfield School District. So I just wanna explain a little bit about what things are gonna look like going forward. It's not gonna be different from what we're, we're doing right now, but I wanna take some time to clear up any confusion that you might have. Um, so this was a Facebook post from the school this morning uh, saying to make sure to log into Teams and check your assignments. Work is now required. Reach out to your teachers with any questions. You know, that's what we've been asking for you to do all along. Um, you know, the difference is now that we're out of school until the end of the year and we're going to be doing remote learning. Uh, we just want to make sure that everybody is participating in the online learning. Uh, through Teams so that nobody falls behind. So when you log on to your PowerSchool, what you're going to see is something like this. Uh, I pulled this from uh, Ms. Paskowitz's class because she had a lot of assignments. Um, but as you can see, there are a bunch of these green check marks here, and then the blue symbol and the orange symbol. So what you're going to see on PowerSchool is a green symbol for work that you've turned in that's complete you'll see a blue symbol for work that you've turned in that is incomplete and an orange symbol for work that's missing. So that way you can take a look and see if there's any assignments that you need to catch up on. Um, and you can see that you're making progress towards all your goals. Speaking of goals, uh, I know that we've been you know, having these videos on here for reading class, and I've been giving you the team's work every week. A lot of you have done a really good job of getting in touch with me uh, regarding that work. I just don't want anyone to forget about iReady because one of the things that the district has asked for, which has not changed, again, is 45 minutes of iReady each week. Um, as you can see here from our time on task for last week, this is everybody. This is not just any individual block. Um, of the 90 reading students, only 22 logged into iReady last week. Those of you who are on are doing amazing work. Some of you far exceeded your goal of 45 minutes for the week. So just make sure that during the week, whenever you have some extra time and you're done with your other class assignments, you spend some time on iReady for reading. I know some of you are also doing it for math intervention. So just please keep it in mind to do some lessons for reading as well, so you can keep on track towards your yearly goals. The third diagnostic is not going to take place, but you're still going to have to take your diagnostic at the beginning of next school year. So think of that as being your next goal, um, and you wanna keep passing lessons to push forward towards that goal. Today, we're going to be talking about tracing and evaluating arguments. So this is something we've touched on kind of briefly in the past <clears throat> during the school year, and we're kind of circling back to it now. Our learning target for today is I will be able to identify an author's claim and trace and evaluate an author's argument. So this is throwing around a lot of different words that you might have encountered in ELA or other subjects, but we want to spend some time focusing on just the reading aspect of this and looking at how this appears in a text. So starting with the basics, what is an argument? Well, when we use the word argument, we usually think of someone having a disagreement with someone. In a text, an argument is the author's reasoning for a particular point of view. So I'm going to give you some examples in a moment, but your goal for the assignment this week is to be looking at what is the author trying to convince me as the reader and how good of a job is the author doing? Every argument starts with what's called a claim. And I know that most of you have talked about this in ELA this year. A claim is a statement of the author's position on an issue. So to help give an example here, I'm gonna choose a very, very basic topic. Cats are better than dogs. That's gonna be our claim that we're gonna follow. And again, when you're reading 
something in a text, you might have a different opinion than what the author says, but it's important to be able to understand the author's position so that you can argue against it. So if our example argument starts with the claim, cats are better than dogs, it's not enough to just state a claim. In an argument text, we want to have facts and other examples and other types of evidence to be able to support that argument. So here are some points that you might see in an argument with this claim. Point one, cats don't need as much attention as dogs. They don't need to be walked every few hours like dogs do. Point number two, cats are natural hunters and can survive on their own. Point number three, according to the Animal Humane Society, adoption fees for kittens and cats start at $32 and run as high as 270. For dogs and puppies, fees start at 115, but go all the way up to $660. So they're more expensive. So these are three points that someone writing this kind of text might bring up to convince you of their viewpoint. Our skill as readers is to be able to what's called trace the argument throughout the text. When you trace an argument, you follow the main idea or claim that the author stated at the beginning of the text. You want to look for reasons and specific types of evidence, facts, statistics, quotations, or opinions that support the claim. So think of it like when you're writing your ACE paragraphs for ELA. You start with your main idea, your answer to the question, and then you want to cite your evidence. Arguments do the same thing, except they're supporting a very specific type of main idea, which is the claim. Our last step as readers is to evaluate the argument. When you evaluate an argument, you decide whether it makes sense and is convincing. The first thing you do is determine whether the evidence supports the claim in a logical way. You make sure that the ideas are presented in a way that makes sense. And then you determine whether the author addresses any opposing viewpoints. Because usually when you make a claim, there's gonna be people who disagree with you. So it's important to look and see whether the author is taking that into consideration and addressing the problems that someone might have with their argument. So did I make a convincing argument about cats versus dogs? Well, that's up for you to decide as the reader when you trace the argument and then you evaluate it and see if it makes sense. So now that we've talked a little bit about tracing and evaluating arguments, we wanna take this from a very simple argument like whether you like cats or dogs better, and apply this to some real world texts from a newspaper. And we'll see if we can trace and evaluate some arguments that are a little bit more complicated. So I'm gonna head over to Teams and take a look at the texts. So here we are in Teams and we have two texts to consider. If you wanna give the text a shot on your own and then try the questions in the doc that's attached to this assignment, you can go right ahead and skip this next part of the video. But if you'd like to follow along while I read them and work through the text together, you can keep watching. So we're gonna be comparing two texts. Our background here gives us some important information that we'll need going into these texts. Wild animals are animals that live in nature. They can be as rare as a snow leopard or as common as a tree squirrel. Although many states have laws that prohibit owning a wild animal, thousands of people in the United States keep animals such as wolves, pythons, crocodiles, and bears as pets. Some people want to make it illegal to have these kinds of pets. They argue that these animals pose a safety and health risk to people and the environment. Others claim that with proper care, wild animals can safely live in captivity. So 
when we're talking about exotic animals, we're talking about wild animals that you normally wouldn't keep as pets. I thought these articles might be interesting with all the discussion going on around the show Tiger King. So I'll be interested to see what you all think after you read these. So the first text is called Wild Animals Aren't Pets. It's an editorial that appeared in the newspaper USA Today. The other text is Let People Own Exotic Animals, which is a commentary by Zuzanna Kokel, and we're going to get more information on what that commentary is when we get to that text. So as we read, we're going to focus on the examples used to justify the points in the editorial by USA Today and the commentary by Zuzanna Kukul, president and co-founder of Responsible Exotic Animal Ownership. Think about which points are convincing to you and which are not. So the first text is an editorial which is a type of argument text that you see in a newspaper on a news website. Normally, newspapers report factual information without having any sort of opinion or slant to them, but sometimes authors will write these pieces called editorials to make a case or an argument for one side or the other. Wild animals aren't pets. In many states, anyone with a few hundred dollars and a yen for the unusual can own a python, a black bear, or a big cat as a pet. For $8,000, a baby white tiger can be yours. Sometimes wild animals are even offered free. Siberian tigers looking for a good home, read an ad in the Animal Finder's Guide. Until recently though, Few people knew how easy it is to own a wild animal as a pet, or how potentially tragic. But just as a 2007 raid on property owned by a football star, Michael Vick, laid bare the little known and cruel world of dogfighting, a story unfolded in a small Ohio city, recently opened the public's eyes to the little known distressing world of exotic pets. We're not suggesting that people who own these animals are cruel. Many surely love them, but public safety, common sense, and compassion for animals all dictate the same conclusion. Wild animals are not pets. So I'm gonna pause here. It seems to me that at the end of this introductory paragraph, we get a simple statement of this author's claim, wild animals are not pets. So I wonder why this author thinks that. So to understand that, we're gonna keep reading and trace the argument. What are the reasons that the author gives for why wild animals shouldn't be kept as pets? Let's keep reading. If that weren't already obvious, it became more so when collector Terry Thompson opened the cages of his Zanesville farm springing dozens of lions, tigers, bears, and other wild creatures before killing himself. With animals running loose and darkness closing in, authorities arrived with no good choices to protect the public. They shot all but a handful of the animals as the nation watched, transfixed and horrified. Owners of exotic animals claim that they rarely maim or kill, but is the death rate really the point? In 2009, a two-year-old Florida girl was strangled by a 12-foot-long Burmese python, a family pet that had gotten out of its aquarium. That same year, a Connecticut woman was mauled and disfigured by a neighbor's pet chimp. Last year, a caretaker was mauled to death by a bear owned by a Cleveland collector. In Zanesville, it was the animals themselves, including 18 rare Bengal tigers, who became innocent victims. Trade in these beautiful creatures thrives in the USA, where thousands are bred and sold through classified ads or at auctions centered in Indiana, Missouri, and Tennessee. There's too little to stop it. A 2003 federal law, which forbids the interstate transport of certain big cats, has stopped much of the trade on the internet, according to the Humane Society of the US. But monkeys, baboons, and other primates were left out and measures to plug that hole have twice stalled in Congress. Only collectors 
who exhibit animals need a federal license. Those such as Thompson, who keep the animals as pets, are left alone unless states intervene, and many do not. Eight, Alabama, Idaho, Ohio, Nevada, North Carolina, South Carolina, West Virginia, and Wisconsin have no rules, and in 13 others, the laws are lax, according to Born Free USA, which has lobbied for years for stronger laws. After the Cleveland bear mauling, then Ohio Governor Ted Strickland issued an emergency order to ban possession of wild animals. While it exempted current owners, Thompson might have been forced to give up his menagerie because he had been cited for animal cruelty. We'll never know. Strickland's successor, John Kasich, let the order expire. So as I read back through this editorial, I see a lot of different situations that are brought up to prove the author's point that wild animals are not pets. It seems that this incident in Zanesville involving Terry Thompson, who let out all of his wild animals before committing suicide, seems to be the strongest point because those animals got loose on this small town and the police had no choice but to shoot them. So it ended up being miserable for people and animals. The author then goes on to give other details and examples, such as the two-year-old girl who was strangled by the python or the Connecticut woman who was harmed by her neighbor's pet chimp. So it seems like this author's strategy is to give lots of different examples about why these pets are dangerous and how the government has not done a good job of protecting people from them and having laws in place so that people can't own them as pets. But that's just one opinion. Now let's take a look at the commentary, Let People Own Exotic Animals. And you can probably tell from the title of the piece that this claim is the opposite of what we just read. The recent tragedy in Zanesville, Ohio, brought back the question of whether private ownership of wild and exotic animals should be legal. The simple answer is yes. Responsible private ownership of exotic animals should be legal if animal welfare is taken care of. Terry Thompson didn't represent the typical responsible owner. He had a criminal record and animal abuse charges. What Thompson did was selfish and insane. We cannot regulate insanity. People keep exotic animals for commercial reasons and as pets. Most exotic animals such as big cats, bears, or apes are in commercial, federally inspected facilities. These animals are born in captivity and not stolen from the wild. Captive breeding eliminates the pressure on wild populations and also serves as a backup in case the animals go extinct. Dangers from exotic animals are low. On average, in the United States, only 3.25 people per year are killed by captive big cats, snakes, elephants, and bears. Most of these fatalities are owners, family members, friends, and trainers voluntarily on the property where the animals were kept. Meanwhile, traffic accidents kill about 125 people per day. If we have the freedom to choose what car to buy, where to live, or what domestic animal to have, why shouldn't we have the same freedom to choose what species of wild or exotic animal to own and to love? Would the Ohio situation be any different if the animals were owned by a government and their caretaker released them? Is this really about private ownership? Or is it about certain people's issues with exotics in captivity? If society overreacts and bans exotics because of the actions of a few deranged individuals, then we need to ban kids because that is the only way to totally stop child abuse. And we need to ban humans because that is the only way to stop murder. Silly, isn't it? So tracing this one is pretty easy. Let people own exotic animals. We've got the claim right in the title. So what are the author's reasons for allowing people to own exotic animals? Well, it seems that she addresses the counter argument that the first article brought up with the incident in Zanesville, Ohio, 
and Terry Thompson. She says Terry Thompson didn't represent the typical responsible owner. He had a criminal record and animal abuse charges. So what that tells me as a reader is that she acknowledges that some people are going to abuse the right to have exotic animals, but that's not a reason to not let everybody else be able to own them. She goes on to give examples of why we should have exotic animals in order to reduce pressure on wild populations and serve as a backup in case the animals go extinct. She then uses a lot of what's called loaded language in the last part of the commentary and a lot of what are called rhetorical questions. It's when you ask a question, but the answer is kind of already obvious. Like at the end, when she starts using examples like banning humans, because that is the only way to stop murder. Silly, isn't it? So clearly this author has a big interest in allowing people to own exotic animals. I'm interested to hear what you think. So if you have thoughts on this, definitely drop them in the comments below this video on Teams. Um, and make sure you head over to the doc that's attached to this assignment so you can fill out the chart and answer the questions that are there. Again, I'm available at any point. If you have any trouble with this assignment, it will be due next week and it will be in PowerSchool shortly after. Keep checking in on PowerSchool. Keep uh, plugging away at iReady. And again, just let me know if you have any questions. I hope that everyone's doing well and staying safe. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.